Welcome. Today's guest is uh, originally born and raised in Georgia. After moving to Rhodey, he started fishing in freshwater and now spends the bulk of his time in the salt. He has a unique business model that he guides kayak fishermen. As a fishing team member at the uh, Kayak Center of Rhode Island, as well as Hobie fishing team member, he's an avid inshore fisherman with a passion for stripers, albies, tog, and sea bass. Even as a fairly late bloomer to the sport, his undying desire to learn all things about fishing has led him to become a multi-species and multi-technique angler. Please welcome Dustin Stevens of Rhode Island Kayak, Kayak Fishing Adventures to the Saltwater Edge Podcast. Dustin, how you doing, man? Good. Thanks for having me. Good, good. Thanks for the comfy chairs. Oh, uh, yeah. Right? Yeah, these kayak chairs are comfortable. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I got over here. I'm like, what are we going to do? And he's like, I got you. Uh, I got you covered. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I thought it was interesting in, in our conversation and reading off your website. Um, you, you weren't... Uh, what, what 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 were you doing when you were a kid in Georgia? That, that when you weren't fishing, what was the, it? Seems like fishing was something more when you got up here. You, you got involved, right? Uh, I mean, growing up, my parents weren't really like outdoorsy people. Got it. Uh, so we spent a lot of time like leisurely traveling. I was an athlete from four years old with basketball. Okay. And then going from football all the way up through uh, high school and then college. And so, Georgia football is no day at the beach. No, it's it not. No, August, it's not. And it's literally one of the best like high school. In the, around, most, right? in the most humid place in the yeah, world. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just so bad. But yeah, I played sports and stuff growing up and we traveled. I was a big gamer. Like those are kind of my hobbies oh, no growing kidding. up. So you're comfortable in that headset? Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. So, <laughs> <laughs> I had to give that up to be, you know, to start fishing. But, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. So you got to roadie and that's when you got into fishing. Correct, yeah. uh, what got you into kayak fishing then? Uh, so I got into fishing. Uh, a buddy of mine uh, invited me out on his bass boat. So that was kind of my first real fishing experience. Yep. Um, you know, went out and caught something. So I'm thinking, okay, this is awesome. And it gives me another hobby to do. And I just went head first after that with, um, after that experience and just based on, you know, my first real fishing experience being from a bass boat, I always do that. I wanted to get off, you know, the bank or get off the shore. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's what led me to, uh, kayak fishing because I knew I couldn't get a boat approved. So, sure. you know, it's just kind of, kind of cheaper and There's easier. There's a couple to buy a of kayak. four kayaks here, right? This For is sure, your, yep. this is your guide operation, right? You Absolutely. roll around that. Yeah. Yep. So, um, you know, the, the, the <clears throat> kayak is, it's interesting. Um, you know, the saltwater edge, we carried kayaks for a while yep. and had a rack a lot like yours, maybe had six and shit, we had the right boat, wrong color. <laughs> For sure. Right boat, wrong size. Mm -hmm. And you just can't do it. And Correct. so we abandoned it and recognized that you have to be a kind of lots of options place like the kayak center that you're affiliated with. Correct. It's a, probably the biggest one in Rhode Island, but I mean, yep. you need that um, selection to serve the kayak customer. Yep. But we found that um, the kayak customer, or the fishing kayak customer, is as hardcore an angler as they, they come, you know? Um, and, uh, um, it's got, you know, the, the kayak itself has some advantages. Um, what would you, um, you know, I don't want to lead the witness. I got some ideas, but, uh, I okay. fished from a kayak only a little bit, uh, you know, years ago. We got to get um, you out here. Then. Yeah. That'd be a lot of fun. Let's That's go. a hell yes. Let's do it. Great idea. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, uh, um, but I'd just be curious, what, what would you call out as the couple of advantages knowing maybe you spend less time on boats and, and did some shore fishing, but right. uh, the kayak fills a, a, a spot in the lineup for sure. I think it fills a lot of voids. Um, number one, you know, it's kind of one of, from the, from a money standpoint, it's kind of one of those vessels where you can just buy and don't really have to maintain. Uh, so it's definitely an advantage there. Uh, from a There's fish not a lot of break uh, in the plastic, roto molded plastic world? Yeah, not really. Yeah. It's rare that you'll have things that break. And, you know, if things do, more than likely it's kind of user error. But, you know, most of these kayak companies have great warranties that they take care of it. Mm -hmm. So you don't have a lot to maintain from mm -hmm. a kayak. So that's the, the biggest advantage right off the bat. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's something you can take anywhere. You know, you can throw it on top of your car or, you know, get a trailer, you know, put it in the bed of your pickup truck and just kind of transport it anywhere. So that's another advantage. And then on the water, it's just, you know, a quiet vessel that you can sneak into a lot of backwater areas that some boats can't get into. And that really helps out. You, bought, um, you know, I, I see you guys uh, a lot around Newport and yep. uh, there's definitely some uh, water that, uh, uh, you know, maybe you don't want Brenton Reef, but there's some other uh, places nearby. Correct. And then there's the skinny that the, Boats that could handle Brent Reef have no business, and then there's uh, more like um, lighter center consoles like mine, and uh, that I'll get into some of it. But you guys are still uh, shallower still, right. and uh, you, you led with what I consider to be the number one 
benefit is that's the stealth. Correct. Correct. And 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 um, you know uh, the one of the areas I can see you guys a lot around Newport's probably um, 10, 12, 8 feet deep that whole King's right. Park over towards Seal Rock that kind of area. Is that kind of the the not that specific area, but that kind of depth, the, really the domain of where the kayak shines, that, you know, under 30 feet kind of stuff? Yeah, I, I, it, I mean, you can definitely do your deep water stuff, you know, off of, you James, can. off of Jamestown, you got that, you know, 120 plus feet. That's so you can, pretty, you, that's you, you can just like you would out of a, out of a center console or something. Yep, absolutely. Okay. But the, you know, to your point, uh, you can definitely get pretty shallow without worrying about damaging, you know, a prop or, you know, a hundred thousand dollar boat yeah, yeah. and you're kind of able to maneuver it the problem is you're so you know um, susceptible to whatever the waves or whatever the you know splash over the rocks wants to do to you so you a lot of people flip in those uh, sketchy type of areas so they get too tight and correct flip. so correct. the flips happen tight pretty much oh wow anytime i mean my general rule of thumb and what yeah, i always tell clients is that anytime you hear uh, waves crashing over rocks, then that's probably an area that you should steer a little clear from, even if you know the fish are hiding in there. Is, you know, if you're trolling, then it's probably better to back off of that area and throw some cast in there so you're not getting too tight to a sketchy area. Same, same rule over. we would have in a boat. You don't want to be broadside and Correct. have one of those bigger waves yep. from the cruise ship or something yep. do a number. And even yeah. with big fish, like sometimes if you connect to a big fish in an area that's that you probably shouldn't be in i always say if a fish is taking you to an area that looks dangerous just turn around and tow them out of there and hope for the best yeah know, right safety first kind of thing always yeah, yeah. yeah i mean it's not uncommon to hear of the rollovers um All but not you know it's not like it's a i you know sometimes i see 20 and 30 people out in some of the spots that uh, i go and i know um you know uh, one of the other things is they you know kayaks certainly have um, the, the shore guy has loads of access issues. Kayak guys kind of do too, because right. you know, if, unless you're, you're Todd walking down the street, uh, you're going to have to rack it you know, or put it on the top of a car For sure. and then find a parking spot. Right. And you know, they're not light; these heavier pedal versions. You know, they're not the the, the early ones that were you know sixty pounds. So right. they um, do have some that are pretty light now. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. But they're they're not rock friendly. No, they're not. This is like no. built like a Yeti. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh what are some of the what are some of the drawbacks of of kayak fishing i'm surprised to hear you fish so confidently in, in, in super deep water yeah uh i would say drawback is range and you know yeah. for a kayak fisherman from that parking spot right? <laughs> from that parking spot yeah, yeah. and just you know you're you're a prisoner to wherever you launch that day like most of us we choose a time of day that we want to launch so like the early window or you know very late um and where you have to make the best of wherever you launch. Like very few guys will launch somewhere in the morning and then take a break and go back out. So it's like wherever you are, you are. While you see some charter boats, you know, they can start in Newport and then book it over to Jamestown and then go yeah. up the bay and go all over. So the I would say the range is what you lose in kayak fishing because you can only go so fast. And we're only really talking now these days. I mean, what is the mix of pedal to paddle? I mean, paddle is my, where my experience and frustration came from. For I mean, sure. I remember once at Kings Park, basically the area we've talked about so far, yep. uh, I was into the Albies in a kayak and I had a choice yep. to make a cast into, into a blitz yep. or be, you know, 20 feet, 30 feet further from my car. Correct. You know, every cast. Drift back. Right. Yep. And so uh, the, the revelation is the pedal. And, and what's the mix now with people fishing kayaks? Almost all are pedal, right? For the most part, uh, I would say pedal drive is pretty much dominating the kayak fishing scene, but you're getting a lot of motorized options. Yeah, one of those companies, Johnson, who had Minn Kota, yep. had a thing, and, it, and they, this is one of our other attempts to solve that, didn't have the right boat uh, right. a couple years ago, this is 10 years ago. Um, uh, I remember it was an innovative idea, it was a pedal system which you could take out and put in a, a yep. basically a Minn Kota engine, you Correct. know, a small trolling thing. Yep. Uh, that's still a thing, right? Yeah, they uh, that kind of uh, solution. There are some spot lock options out there. Oh my God. You know, so for can do it all. <laughs> people that like to bottom fish. Actually, my kayak, the one on the other side, mm -hmm. I add a um, a motor guide to the front of it. So that's a uh, you know a bow mounted motor for me that I have spot lock on. So pedal drives are definitely dominating, but you're seeing a lot more um, a lot more motorized options. But very few guys paddle, uh, so it's kind of 
you know, from a fishing standpoint, it's kind of dying out. But leisurely, I think it's still pretty fun. Oh, good point. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. That's what that's who's buying those. Yeah, for right? sure. That, yeah, I'm, I didn't think about the that leisure at all. and the, the sea kayakers. Though, those guys go hard. But yeah, uh, yeah. for fishing, it's just easier to have your hands, you know, free for the most part. Yeah. Um, and just kind of go from there. Sounds really good. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, we get in the shop a lot a question like uh, somebody's gonna. Uh, I want um, a rod for my boat, you know, yep. seven foot, or they come on a fly rod, you know, for here's what I'm going to do. And you pick a kind of basic um, package. And I'm not thinking so much about brands as I'm thinking about type and style and length. Specs, yeah. You know, might be the nine weight intermediate fly rod, might be the seven foot throws three quarter to two right. uh, boat, you know, a uh, light tackle rod. Well, if you're going to spec a kayak generally for somebody, what would you, uh, someone who's curious, it sounds like it's going to be a pedal. Um, can you give us some of the some of the basic uh, things and in, in what you know price range? I think it'd be curious to people. I know it's sure. Um, I would say if you are um, if you're saltwater fishing, you want something at least eleven foot uh, in length, um, twelve or longer. You know, is a little bit better as far as tracking and speed is concerned. You're just kind of cutting through the waves. Uh, so the longer the better, but you don't have to go too crazy with that. And that so length would, is to maybe cover the swell i know what the, the nautical term is right but yep. you're, yeah yeah okay. uh, absolutely and i mean sometimes like you said you go out really far and you want to get back fast so that longer kayak is going to be a little bit faster for you um and you want something really stable as well and most fishing kayaks are made to you know withstand leaning within a certain range so to far get on the one fish. side or another you have to get the fish or you know get your snag out or whatever happens um but i would say the outback is you know kind of the tried and true, you know, it's about 13 feet long, pedal kayak, um, weighs about, you know, 85 to 90 pounds. Wow. So that's like that's the, less than I thought. Do you, is that without the whatever option you use to drive it? Well, the drive, I mean, the, the Hobie drive only weighs what, maybe eight to 10 pounds. Oh, okay. So it's not adding. I'm thinking back to those, you know, the motors but yeah, and all those uh, other contraptions at the beginning. Other companies do have some like pretty really heavy. beastly um, yeah. pedal and motor systems, but uh, it's not the, the Hobie pedal drive isn't adding too much weight okay. um, to the kayak, but I would say, you know, 11 to 13 feet ish is a good range. Um, is there a width number? Because I remember when we were selling kayaks, that was part of it, you know, because it was the width that got you um, the ability to lean. I would say. Or even stand up and fish in it. I would say like 34, 34 inches plus okay. across is a good width. Um, when kayak fishing first got popular, it was all about having those big, like stable kayaks. And I wanted this thing to be like 50 inches wide. And then you have a kayak like the Hobie Revolution, which is a pretty thin kayak, but the advantage there is speed. Like a lot of Albi, a lot of hardcore Albi guys or guys who like to cover a lot of water, they'll use that Revolution because it just flies, but it's only like 33 to 34 inches wide. Um, so here's one of the things I realized in my kayak sales experience. And yep. let's look at, it was uh, if you let someone take a demo, yep. um, which makes sense. If never in their kayak fishing career will they be more leery of tipping over than the day they put it in the first time, which is called the demo. Right. right. So yep. Yep. they would all buy these wide ass boats, heavy yep. for stability. Yep. And then I would assume not much long later they go, damn, this thing's heavy. Uh, and, and, and start to, to narrow, but it wasn't where they'd start. You, you see a lot of that. There's probably need stability is just a generally not the issue maybe it used to be that it's been designed around, I don't know. I think with kayak fishing having grown so much, people realize that a company that's making a fishing kayak is making something that's, you know, relatively to very, you know, stable. Yeah. So you, stability and is kind of- to, a, Like you said, get the fish or whatever. It's kind of an afterthought stability at this point. And when kayak fishing started, it was all about heavyweight stability. Now it's streamlined. You got kayaks like the Hobie Lynx that's, you know, 45 pounds. Yeah, my the guys are taking offshore, yeah. you know? So it's, the game has changed a little bit, but you know, you definitely want something stable. I'm glad we did that on. recap because it is definitely uh, changed a lot for me. And from a boat or, you know, on a rack, they, yep. it's hard to see the differences, you know. Um, you recognize they all got pedals. They all have some type of electronics probably, yep. uh, some of that kind of stuff. Um, and um, much like a center console would in terms of electronics. Right. Um, the, uh, I was curious, how did you put together uh, the idea of doing guided kayaks? I mean, I, I know, I, I think I've heard, you know, maybe considered a trip like that in some, you know, Florida vacation or something right. like that. Um, 
So I'm aware that it's a thing, but for sure. it's uniquely a thing here. I don't really think of anybody else who does it. There is, I guess it's kind of a few other options out there, but, yeah. for, but for me, um, I'm super passionate about these things. And I think when you're kind of, when you start to get known for doing pretty well, people reach out with you know yeah. a million questions and stuff. And um, at the time, I, the time I thought about, you know, committing to it, yep. uh, I just kind of took a couple people out to see if I like it. And I mean, one of my favorite parts about it is the teaching aspect and, you know, kind of putting instructions out there and then seeing it all come together for people. I just love to see that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I started it and just said I would give it my all. And yeah, I am. Yeah, that's right. That's great. Um, uh, what's the, uh, what's your uh, Instagram? Uh, by Instagram is Dustin Goes Fishing, yeah. um, and then we have a company Instagram which is ri at ri kayak fishing adventures. Okay. On because uh, you're pretty st you're pretty steadily um, post there, and Correct. you know uh, the um, and a variety of uh, seems like everybody who goes ends up with a with a fish Something. and a smile. Yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> it's a pretty good job, you know. I mean, it's that's, it's uh, a blast. Yeah. It's, it's really a blast. That's I mean, awesome. it can be crazy at times, but it's so fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so we kind of covered some of the, the vessel advantages. One of the ones I think I want to spend a little bit more time on is it's not an area that I, uh, you know, have a lot of experience. But I would think the kayak um, would be, um, you know, particularly good for, for bottom fishing. I didn't recognize maybe we could fish as far, but you can get right on top of something. Correct. Stay pretty quiet. Yep. Um, it's got to be different when you've got an engine than, it, uh, than when you have, a, you know, like a... Uh, um, like the uh, charter guys do when they're right. set up on a on a spot. Um, right. So, um, you know, what uh, do you, you see that as a pretty um, regular advantage to, to kayak fishing? Absolutely. I think with most guys that bottom fish from the kayak, uh, especially with the pedal drives, uh, you're pretty much kind of nosing into the current, whichever way the current's coming. You're, you want your nose into that and you're kind of using your legs as like a human spot lock. But like I mentioned, there are a lot of motor options out there as well that can kind of keep you in place. But I so, see these guys just, you know, yep. and they're just holding their, they're yep. holding their spot. Holding your spot with your legs. I do that more often than not. I'm not one to anchor a lot. Yeah. Um, but some people anchor and they, you know, bottom fish very effectively, but it really works out and it's just, you know, a lot of fun. To, so you're to fishing, fish. you know, here we are in these kayak, Chairs, literally. Office chairs, right? Yeah, right. Like, yeah. But you're doing, you, you just turn your upper body and, and yep. fish, I'm, right? I'm pretty much. Because you have that issue with the bow itself. You got the bow, and then my fish finder is always on the right, and even all of my um, clients' kayaks, everything is set up the same, so all the fish finders are on the right. So yeah. I always kind of, you know, just pitch my jig in front of me and use the kayak to get vertical with it. So if the current is kind of taking it out a little bit, then I'll pedal up just so that jig is sitting right by the kayak and then I'm just, you know, jump up and down. You know, you're, you're, just the way you describe that reminds me of uh, sometimes you float a river, a trout river or a smallmouth bass river, the oars on the um, drift boat yep. are presenting, you know, some of your your lures and flies because it buy you time Absolutely. or you speed it up yep. or, you know, two, two, two uh, cranks upstream buys you a little bit more of a drift it's, right. it's really uh you're trying to fishing. figure out the formula while you're yeah, out there yeah. like, you know how fast is the drift going and i always i always preach like not scoping out too far from the kayak just because if your lure is way out there and you're bringing it back in you're just dragging it over the seafloor and you're bound to snag so yeah. if you're vertical even if you get snagged you're kind of able to just get right on top and pop it out yeah and and easier done with the kayak very yeah yeah, yeah. Yep. okay so that's um so, um, yeah, good. We've covered most of my uh, questions around the uh, advantages of a kayak. Yep. Um, so let's dial it into some fishing uh, scenarios. Maybe um, you know we we fish some of the same places here in Rhode Island. Yep. And right now we're in July. Yep. Uh, we've certainly um, seen the stripers move off a of structure, move off of bait onto structure. Yep. Um, we have some bottom fish that are in and out of season right now. Right. Um, gator bluefish around. Uh, a lot. <laughs> uh, I don't know uh, if that's really uh, all that. I mean, I love a gator bluefish. I'm not sure I'd love a gator bluefish in a kayak. What do you do to solve that problem? It depends. It's not you. You got three kayaks. It could be some dude from Missouri, right? Okay, so take yeah. me from that one. Uh, yeah, we literally had a guy. Um, he came from Ohio to you know try it out or mm -hmm. whatever, and uh, 
he ended up getting a blue. And on that same trip, another guy, uh, he ended up kind of reaching for the bluefish and he ended up getting his hand, you know, pretty gashed up there. And it happened so fast before I could even say anything that, you know, we had to kind of open the first aid kit, which rarely happens. But yeah. uh, he was he was fine after that and was able to catch a few more. But I think it depends on what lure you catch that bluefish on. So if we're trolling the tube and we get a bluefish on the tube, he's pretty much coming to the side of the kayak. You're grabbing the tube itself and yeah. then putting him in the kayak and just figuring it out. Um, if you catch him on like a topwater lure or an epoxy, something with a treble hook, then now you really have to uh, pay attention to where they are. And for the most part, I would net them if I can, mm -hmm. um, except on a tube. If I, Like I said, if I get a tube bluefish, I'll pull them in by the lure itself. On any other presentation, I'll pretty much net that fish or grab his tail and flip him in the kayak. Yeah. Um, getting those hooks out can be a little crazy because they're always thrashing. And sure, I know sure. a couple of guys that have gotten hooks in their hand from that. Do you, um, do you, uh, um, I'm thinking about clients, yep. um, cause you really just can't be as present maybe as you would be if you're in a center console with right. it, right? Um, it's the hardest part. Yeah. Everybody's in their own vessel. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, would you make any lure modifications? Um, you know, single in the back or something like that. Cause just numbers game on right. that, right? This year I've gone to more, uh, single hooks on epoxies and even on like SP minnows, which we use those a bunch. Um, I've tried to go to single hooks more, but just, you know, I have my crate somewhere over here and I just have so much tackle in there. Uh, so when it's time to switch tackle and, you know, you're hot and heavy in the action, sometimes I just grab whatever lure um, to try to take advantage of that. And sometimes it's still a treble. So mm -hmm. I haven't gone a hundred percent singles, you know, cause even, per you know, me personally during like Albi season, you just, for your first few albies, you want that insurance of yes. the treble hook. Yeah, yeah. And then after that, you can kind of play around with single hooks. But uh, they are, you know, it, it's it's a lot safer from I, I, a guy's You reminded me uh, um, when we were uh, in the same place last fall. I don't know if you remember this. On I the do. Albies. Very <laughs> and, much so. And uh, you, uh, I was trying, I was, a, a fish boiled behind you. And mm -hmm. we were, you know, talking, a little more than talking distance. Mm -hmm. Um but a fish boiled behind you, and I'm like, well, you know, that's fair game, right? For sure. <laughs> yep. You were like, boom, boom, two backwards, and you were you were in them. Yes. Yep. <laughs> I, I love doing my backflip during the Albi season. Yes. It's like throw it back, and you're you're tight. It's just so crazy. It but, is. Um, it is. It's uh. Well, we're we're uh, we're currently in July, so let's do a little July, and then we'll then we'll get all amped up it, on Albi. So it's some it's some July Albies out there somewhere, yeah, right? Yeah, <laughs> in our so, dreams. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's where they are. Yeah, for sure. It's coming. <laughs> um, what do you what do you have uh you know it's um it's the hazy hot and humid um you know the shore guy's a little frustrated um uh and you fish a lot of the same water the shore guy does but i'm sure you can use your kayak to create some advantages i'd be curious how you do that and then um you know that you can't maybe go to the obvious uh big water places uh you know as safely as a center console or even some of these contenders and you know 27 28 size uh boats you know right. so there's a there's a well um a uh um, a uh, window in there that i think would be your of operation you know i have a i have a guide buddy of mine who does mostly uh fly and, and light tackle yep. and he sets his fish finder to like six feet to 15 feet uh or his safety alarm or something i'd have to learn a little bit more but the point is this is where he wants to be right and so he uses that uh, to map. Um, to stay on his area. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and not so much maybe a piece of structure too, but just like here are my options. Well, how do you how do you look at um, the kayak in this kind of summer doldrums? Um, you, said, you mentioned I think we were doing uh, we did a little um, focus thing before we shot this, and you mentioned you know flounder up uh, fluke upcoming for example. Um, what do you how do you look at the July August stretch? Uh, typically for July you still have. A lot of a lot of stripers are still on bait kind of early part of july yep. but as you mentioned they kind of push off to uh, sh to structure uh, so a typical outing for me whether i'm guiding or um, by myself is i'll start for you know like striper and blue thing um trolling throwing some casts and that trolling that tube right trolling the tube trolling the sp minnows um or like a deep diving plug those are kind of the main three things that i would troll what deep diver do you like because i do some slow trolling I uh, think it's a, um, 
you guys have it in the shop. I think it's either a the hoagie or the X wrap Rapala. I think it's a Yozur. I think it Rapala. Yeah, yep. yeah. It goes about fifteen to seventeen feet. Yeah, yeah. Um, those are those are pretty effective Great as well. Great fish finder. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, but after a certain point, once these you know hot high sun, then I'll switch over to bottom fishing. Yeah, you know, and go from there. But the key is really moving around a lot, and I do that anyway. Even if you know fish are around bait, I'm always moving. Like I can move my legs, or if I'm using my motor just always checking new spots and trying to cover as much ground as possible. But yeah, I'll striper and blues early. And then after that, you know, try for some sea bass or fluke. Um, I'm thinking as we get closer to, you know, August, the fluke bite should probably start to pick up out front a little bit more. It's been pretty solid in the bay, but mm -hmm. I'm hoping there's a few more opportunities out front for us. Yeah. Um, I haven't done a bunch of fluke fishing myself. What would be some basic considerations going into Fluke fishing in August, not so much, you know, uh, you know, what is the kind of um, structure you're looking for and what's the kind of maybe tackle and technique you, you know, find productive? I try to look for like, you know, sand flats that are either, either close to structure or something with like nice contour lines and just try to drift those. And the key for fluke fishing from a boat or kayak, you know, is just finding that right drift. So try for to move around. Or for just finding the right drift until you get the hits because you know some you, you can have like a perfect drift speed but they may not be there so you're checking all the spots the spot the stereotypical spots that you would check uh, and then once you kind of start catching a few then it's like okay this is this is the area I'm going to key in on I've had another buddy talk about contour absolutely and um, I assume like warmer getting cooler Right. And is that what you kind of is that the, the kind of search algorithm between temperature and depth? You find a sweet spot where they're comfortable now. I think in, for, for me, yeah. I mean, fishing is all theory, right? We make up things in our oh, minds. Yes. Oh, um, yes, I think I just did. Yep. <laughs> for me, um, I look at it as if they're on like a drop off and you're, you know, drifting a certain way, the current's going that way. They're on the bottom. And as something passes by, that's their opportunity to kind of turn around and tail it a little yep, bit more. Sure. Uh, so, you know, that's what I think as far as contours are concerned, but sometimes they're just on nice flats with, you know, not too much character out there and just hanging out or you can find them by wrecks or, you know, right even on rock piles and stuff. Yeah. Um, tackle wise, you know, the classic high, low rapid vertical jigging is nice. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are rigs like, uh, like the, the fluke rigs that you see from a boat. Like I think, uh, BJ makes one yeah, yeah. and, uh, I just picked up some more. Uh, recently so those are just kind of adding adding a sinker throwing some squid or you know gulp or whatever on the back of the rig and just drifting with a kayak not doing anything just yeah. throwing the rods and the rod holders and uh just waiting on that hit is that, i've done uh, that a lot is that how's that go for clients they, they, they're like <laughs> what, you know what i mean is that your jam that's the other side of it um for clients i would typically if we're specifically going for fluke i'd start them off with like the high low yes. bucktail or um, ball head jig, gulp, and a teaser on top. And we'll see how that's going. And if we're getting a lot of either bycatches or, you know, they're getting tired, because it's not easy rapid vertical jigging right. for a long period of time for some people that focused. aren't, aren't used to it. When you're learning something new. Right, so, I'll, so if we go to the rig, then I just have to remember, just like when I'm telling people about the tube, line management is key, you know, and kind of controlling your drift. So they're kind of able to see some of the ways that you can control a drift in a kayak just having the rig behind them and not worrying about actively jigging. Yeah. So it, you know, it's worked pretty effectively over there. Yeah, years. I mean, I, I, earlier in this conversation, you talked about scope yep. and how you use your, you know, you're able to use your kayak right. to do very, because once, my experience is in boats, but once you get the feel, mm -hmm. um, you settle in and you, 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 you get efficient. Correct. Right, but uh, until you've lined up drift and depth and lure weight and- right. You know, uh, it's a bit of a flail. I'd rather them, I for fluke, I'd rather them be actively jigging or sea bass or whatever bottom species we're going for. I'd rather them actively jig, but uh, like I said, in a pinch where it's not working well or the drift is too fast, then we'll throw in that rig with the heavy sinker and just mm -hmm. kind of drag bottom and uh, hope for the best down there. Um, the, uh, sorry, I had to write myself a note. Okay. Um, so uh, the, um, so it's the, 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 the summer, the summer day starts off tubing worm or, or trolling an SP minnow type thing, and then uh, switching to bottom fishing. Right. Um, and and when we were doing our uh, little um, uh, inshore focus, 
you kind of lit up on the idea of uh, August is coming. And then, then after August, so Eric and I were on the water together a couple of days ago, and I was like I said, I was having a good go at the at the uh, console, um, you know, at the wheel, yeah. uh, vertical jigging while fly guy in the front and the spin guy in the back. Oh, that's fun. And you know, it was the variety. It was scup. It was it was sea bass. It was tiny tog. It right. was you know out of season, in season. It's a mishmash. Right. Um, but uh, um, you know, and then we saw you know some birds on top over there, and the bottom fishing stopped. Correct. <laughs> we yep. Went, yep. You know, and I, I don't know if I'll ever get to be as good. You know, or I don't think I'll ever be as good. But it was a bunch of guys who I really respect who dial that stuff in and are very um, proficient. You know, and efficient yeah. and. Uh, um, obviously, whatever you're going to be good at, you got to commit to. For but sure. having it in your bag and your armamentarium is a nice way. When we were um, doing that focus thing, you you talked about uh, the game on jig, yep. but uh, jigs in general. Yep. Um, that's what I was doing. It seems to me to be the simple solution, right? To uh, to scup, to sea bass, to tog. You know, if if you're just fish for whatever is biting. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah, we typically, uh, like I mentioned in the focus, uh, most mornings we're going to start off the troll. I think that helps people that aren't really like used to kayak fishing. They're trying to get their bearings together. If they're able to just focus on getting the kayak and getting their bearings together Going there, where they want while to having go. a line behind them, yeah. that always is a good start. Yeah. But, you know, we're always looking for opportunities for people to cast because a lot of fishermen like to, you know, fish actively. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The funny thing is if guys do hook up on that tube early, they don't want to put it away. So it's like... Interesting. You know, you'll get a message. Oh, I want to come out for top water stripers, and I say, okay, I have all the top waters ready, and I literally have like fifteen of them sitting in my kayak. I say, we'll start trolling, we'll see what happens, and then we'll switch over if the opportunity presents itself. And you know, they end up getting a fish or a huge fish, and it's like, oh yeah, I'll do another pass, and I'll do another pass, and by the time we keep passing, the five hours is over. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, people love it, but we're always looking for opportunities for top water or you know, throw soft plastics for people that's interested in that. Yep. Um, the, uh, uh, so we're, let's, uh, let's roll into Albi season. Let's you know, go. Benito, <laughs> Benito and Albi season. It's coming. Um, you know, it is, uh, uh, remarkable how the kayak can, uh, you know, especially when you get in tight quarters, uh, either tight, shallow or tight, like boat traffic, which is, which is the Albi thing. Correct. Um, you know, uh, from a, um, uh, from a guide's perspective with a couple people with you what is it you, how how is it how is it you approach albi fishing when you are on a on a charter if you will you know it's not one boat one location this guy in the bow that you know how do you how do you keep that together it, it's funny it depends on where we are but you know some of the you know key albi spots that uh, a lot of us fish you can sometimes see them like right from the launch so the the first thing before we get on the guided trip we're always doing a briefing and you know everything that happens negatively in the past i have to address in the next briefing so with albies i'm kind of breezing through the briefing and we're seeing fish pop up and it's like okay let's get out there and i always have everyone set up with an epoxy jig first that's always the tried and true for it mm -hmm. if i have multiple people like you know three four five six person trip then i'll have people with a few different color options like you know you're kind of using you're kind of using the group to figure out what, what sure. are they keyed that's in a, on. That's it. actually an advantage of, yeah. of that, the scenario you're in. Absolutely. And it's just really telling people to keep their eyes open, um, you know, because, you know, it's only, you know, I'm only one set of eyes here. Yeah. So it's like, use your own eyes. And if you see anything pop, then take a, take a shot at it and just trying to coach them through the different retrieves. Uh, some people aren't great casters that come out with us yeah. and some people have never fished before. So that's part of it too. It's like, oh, it's Albi season. They're popping up all over and I'm telling you to cast right here, but that's not something you can do. So now we're spending time um, trying to work on that or either trolling. Like yeah. if, after so much time, if you're not getting the cast down pack, then- Always be trolling. Go ahead and troll it. Always yep. be trolling. Yep. Yep. The, um, so uh, one, since we have, I haven't had this conversation with anybody in, you know, 10 months, yep. uh, talk to me about your Albi retrieves. When you, um, what's in that briefing, you know, as it relates to your, customers and how to retrieve for albies the standard i always say is if you're like casting at a blitz or even blind casting is just to cast as far as you can let it sink for about one to two seconds and just a nice it's hard to really uh tell people speed like i'll mm -hmm. say i'll say a nice steady retrieve and someone might be steady here or someone might be steady here so you know you try to like say medium retrieve or you try to find yeah. words that make sense to tell people in their on their terms <laughs> on yeah. their terms 
Um, so using layman's terms helps, but mm -hmm. I like a nice, let it sink a little bit and just ride right under the surface, especially if you're seeing bait right there, because that bait is, the bait is up top. So yep. you yep. want to kind of cast it right through it or on the side of them. Uh, so yeah, just a nice, nice steady uh, retrieve after about a two second drop. But what's your, what's your uh, cause I, I totally agree. And I think dialing in the speed is a thing. Right. Um, there might be a day or time when a fast retrieve uh, is warranted. But for me, uh, the Albie's fast, the bait's not. Yep. And um, so try to pace it. Um, what do you do? Um, um, you must have people flipping out. Like there's so much bait, you know? Yep. Uh, what do you have for solves when there's so much bait? Um, what do you do? You mix it up color? Do you mix it up size? Well, the size uh, mainly. I like the um, I like the medium size XO jig. So what's that? The three quarter or the little bit longer? The one ounce. I think the medium size is the one. The smaller one I think is the three quarter. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so but that ounce. medium size is just like you can't go wrong. When in doubt, you don't want too big, or too small. You want to go medium. Yeah. Uh, but if it's you know if it's smaller bait that's out there or they're finicky, then after that you go from uh, the you know, epoxy jig to a plastic. So yep. the Albi snack or like the little uh, gravity tackle six inch eels are pretty deadly on a light yeah. jig head too. Sure. Um, but just a nice steady retrieve and twitch as you go and they hammer it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so a mix of jigs and soft plastics. That's usually what we do. Uh, I'll bring stuff out for like, you know, um, egg and fly or whatever, but <laughs> that, that can get pretty crazy just trying to teach that amongst everything else. So if someone's familiar with that, and they're finicky then we'll try that but for the most part plastics or epoxies and sure when does. you fish with one or two other people yep. um that's difficult when you when you get to three it's probably six times as hard when you get to eight it's 12 times as hard or four it's 12 times as hard it's for sure exponentially di more difficult right. i would presume for right? sure yeah i mean typically on like three, four, five, six person trips, because we, we kind of cap it at six. Um, you know, I'm, You're I'm, only hauling four boats, right? What happens then? Well, I can, this is a, a new trailer right here, so I'm able to haul five comfortably, but it has a thousand pound weight capacity, so I, I can see. probably fit like seven yaks on here. Oh, wow. And then throw one on the car too, but uh, typically on group trips, I'm not by myself. Uh, Johnny comes out with me and um, it's, I mean, it's a godsend having a yeah. second set of hands, sure. you know, for, for, with six people out there. Yeah, yeah. We, we've had our trips where it's like, you know, four, four or five, six people hooking up at the same time, or three of them tangled, two All of them hooking fish. up, blues, <laughs> you know, it's just chaotic. So, Sign me up. Uh, for sure. So <laughs> ha having, having someone out for group trips definitely helps out. But um, even if I'm by myself, it's just, you know, we, we have radios. So I try to cover as much as I can during the briefing portion because I feel it's easier to address it there than mm -hmm. once you're in the action. Even though, you know, it's 4 a.m. and people are, you know, thinking about what they want for breakfast and wanting to get yeah. on the water and all that stuff. So they forget 90% of what I say, but I try to really um, harp on some things as far as controlling a fish, line management, watching out for other kayakers and boaters, like, you know, just trying to address that. But yeah, yeah. For, for big groups, just having a, a I don't know, awesome. you know, exactly, you know, when I know I see you and I see a cluster with you and I yep. figure you keep them all fairly close, right? You don't have like that stray guy who, oh, we get that a lot. Oh, um, really? Yeah. You get people that, yeah. <laughs> what a pain in the neck that must be. It, it's so funny. We'll say like, especially with bottom fishing, because that's, you know, I, I include fish finders on, on all the kayaks and i think with bottom fishing you really have to use it because you're naturally drifting so as soon as you stop pedaling drop that jig you're off your spot so for me as soon as i hit the water you know it's obviously a customer service part of it that you want to address but my primary mode goes into like finding fish so if we're sure. if we're fishing and we're like hey you know uh there are fish right here and then you have somebody like drifting out there their line scoping out so you call them on the radio hey you know come up here we're kind of fishing this this pile um, and then, you know, some people are just willy nilly or, or, or the other side of the coin, it, some people are very experienced and they do feel more self-sufficient. So ideally if with, with trolling or with casting, once I can kind of show you the lay of the land, what to do a few times, maybe about half the time of the trip, then it's really cool to see it all come into fruition for the rest of the trip on by themselves, own. you know, yeah, yeah, cool. and you're, and you're just kind of supervising, giving them something yeah. for sure. You're supervising to that point, and I mean, one thing I really love is getting, you know, the pictures of people with their catching after the fact. Um, I mean, we get a lot of repeats, but even people that just come out one time, they figure it out, and you know, to kind of see them using the same techniques and 
having success after that's that's very rewarding right there. yeah so i bet yeah. i bet the um well you know let's uh transition here yep um into a little bit of a, a couple of questions i'd like to ask uh most people um what would be you know from the kayak fishing perspective what would be two resources you would recommend to folks that might want to learn more about kayak uh fishing you know in new england um is there you know is it an app is it a bulletin board is it a magazine you know what are, or a book you read that you know this this one's i give it to you know people who ask i suggest they do this i would say a couple resources i would say the number one resource is to uh go out with a pretty cool uh kayak kayak company Rhode yeah. Island kayak fishing <laughs> adventures. you'll learn it all there that's right um and i would live say by like, experience live by experience yeah, and also uh i, I mean i uh, agree totally yeah. with that premise as whatever it is you want to learn for sure um and um, I also um, feel kind of strongly that multiple trips works, whether you're trying to learn how to um, kayak fish or, um, you know, jig and pop tuna or right. whatever this niche thing you want to learn, right. go a couple of times uh, during the year, right? Because one-off experience might have loaded you up with ideas, right. but I, I sometimes see people try to repeat that in totally the wrong time of year. Or if, if, you must have some yep. experience, right? Yeah, I would say um, just kind of getting off track a little yeah, bit. Sorry. We'll get that was back. me. But, um, <laughs> no, no, no. It, I'll just say that I think that starting it, it was kind of a bridge to get people interested or give them, you know, an affordable option to try mm -hmm. it before investing three, four, five, six yeah, thousand dollars into too. it. Um, but just the amount of repeats that, you know, come back for different times or try for different species or some guys keep coming back for the same thing. Um, wanting to learn something different every time has been uh, has been pretty surprising uh, yeah. for me so far. But you, you reminded me of something else. You know, uh, when you go um, jig and pop with a captain, get on a got on a, a boat that's built for it. Yep. Um, split it with a couple guys. For sure. That the tackle's right, the rigging's right. Absolutely. I mean, there'll be a day when you can do that, but it, you know, that, that way your attention is on. Uh, technique and for sure and taking in the experience right? right versus some of the more not mundane but absolutely critical but <laughs> not um you can learn that in you know, over time absolutely yeah 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 i would definitely say uh, doing a charter is a great resource i would say you know hanging around um you know checking out your local dealer is also a resource as far as stuff that you'll need because you know you, you buy the kayak you save up your four grand you buy a nice kayak and now what? Now what? You know, do you have do you have your life vest? Do you have your radio? Do you have this, that, and the other? So I would say, you know, hanging around a dealer. Uh, YouTube videos are great. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think uh, you did one for us, right? I um, did. Yep. Sort of a, and, and I didn't watch the whole thing. Rigging uh, like a pro. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, see, he, so, he didn't he didn't watch his own publication. <laughs> you see you see how you do, guys. <laughs> so, um, but you covered uh, kind of uh, what, how you described what was you, the content you covered in that video. It, it was a cut breakdown of, of like how to rig different yeah. style of kayaks. I used three different type of Hobies, the Pro Angler, the Outback, and I also have the Hobie Lynx. So that video was just kind of showing people what you need and how I go about rigging. And I'm fishing. pretty simplistic uh, for, you know, rigging my kayak. It's just fish finder. Um, my, I'll bring my GoPro. I have a crate system in the back. I have a ton of tackle inside every nook and cranny that I could find, but yeah. um, I'm very simple as far as rigging. No, I think it, and it, would, it would have to be because there's three strangers in the other boats and, and they have to be laid right. out. It, it's funny, like I, I, I wanted to, I started with like really nice kayaks, obviously, and really nice fish finders. And I used more higher end rods than I've dialed it back to now, just by the amount that we've lost and have gotten broken. But mm -hmm. I wanted people to have the same experience that I have. So yeah. if I'm using a nice kayak, I don't want you in something lesser than. If yeah. I'm using a nice fish finder, I want you to be able to see the same thing that I see so that we're on the same page. Sure. Um, so that was kind of an oversight, but I just wanted the whole thing to be more of a premium feel. And I think a lot of yeah. people appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah, I think they would. Um, so uh, kayak is unique um, and offers you some unique access that we covered right off the top that yep. um, it was stealth. But uh, do you have any maybe um, tips, like uh, maybe it's a rigging tip or, uh, you know, something I always do when I first get a kayak is this, you know, any, any kind of things that would go in the couple tips category? 
uh, tips, I would suggest some some safety items at first. Uh, PFDs, um, paddles. If you buy a Hobie, you always want to have a paddle. That's um, in case the drive fails. Is that's that... in case the drive fails, or like it's the whole pedal drive and motor craze now. Um, but those things can fail, as nice as they may be. So you always, always have to have a paddle. And well, you never you service them, I guess, but you wash them off just like I, and run water through the engine like right. I do with my center console. But mm -hmm. it's a it's a failure is how you're going to figure it out a there's, lot of the time. There's very little maintenance that's involved. So I'll typically um, I'll typically go to the kayak center and uh, Rachel and Matt. They're really good about repairs. I also have a good friend uh, Peter. He does a lot of like stuff for me as far as rigging the kayaks are concerned. So. Um, but when I first get a kayak, I always add like anchor trolleys. You want a flag on there. You want a fish finder and a fish finder, not really even for the fish. It's really a safety item because, you know, a lot of areas that we fish, it's always fogged out and you can't see anything. So mm -hmm. while you can use your phone, um, your phone won't really show you the way that you came. So having that uh, GPS yeah. enabled fish finder, you'll have, you know, an arrow following you throughout the day. So you'll know where to go back to. Uh, I think that's very important to have. And yeah, I would just say, don't go crazy. Buy the necessities and um, get out there, see how you like it and, you know, add from there, add, add or yeah. subtract from there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. cool, cool. Yeah. Um, so um, here's a question I ask uh, everybody. Um, so uh, you have uh, one last day on earth and right. one last day to fish, All okay? Right. Um, where are you, no exactly where but what type of fishing and um you know what time of year what's your what would be your your uh walk off uh here or anywhere I anywhere wow that's tough i, I would say it. based <laughs> <laughs> all right uh, right off the bat i'd say just based on doing this so much and as much as i love it i don't think i'd spend that last moment here i'd probably try for something that i haven't caught before um it's kind of a really weird species, but I really want to go to Texas and catch one of these huge like alligator gars. Ah. Like they are just so like pre prehistoric looking and stuff. Yeah. Um, so that would be a possibility. Uh, try to catch you know like a marlin or something like that. I think I would something try to. Something haven't done before. Something I haven't done before. I try to go pretty big, you know. Yeah. On, on my way out. And <laughs> I mean, if I if I could do it from a kayak, that would be even more incredible. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So sure, yeah. it's a great question because. Um, the guys that listen to the podcast heard it before, but it, I've heard some, you know, absolutely stellar anglers. Just wow, um, uh, yeah. You know, it really because you get you so up. caught up in what we do, right. and some people might, you know, love striped bass enough where they say, you know what, the last fish I catch will be a striped bass. Yeah, but want to hold the tail for sure. I'm all about that, like new experience. So sure. I would try for something I haven't tried before. Excellent. So where can people go to learn more about your business and uh, all of that? I know you got a. Your uh, your wife is a big help on, on on the marketing and the logistics. She's awesome. But uh, what is the um, where can people go to learn more? Uh, we have a website. It's uh, r i k f a dot com. Uh, basically, short for Rhode Island Kayak. It'll be in the show adventures. notes. Yep, yep. It'll be. Uh, he'll have the link below. Uh, you can check us out on uh, Instagram. Um, pretty not, steady there. Pretty steady there on IG. Most I not even posting my stuff more. It's more of the clients. Like they get more they get more shine than anything. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's a, those are two resources. You can always uh, email us. Um, our email is on the website as well with a okay. contact form. And um, take if it you ever need anything, just take yeah. it from there. Yeah. Excellent. Sounds yeah. great. Hey Dustin, thanks a bunch. Fun times. Thanks for oh, having yeah. me. You always fun it. times. You bet. Yeah. Man. So we will. Uh, and uh, I think I will take you up on that. You, you have know? to. Yeah, that'd be a we lot of fun. You have to get Peter in a <laughs> kayak this year. Maybe for Albie season. Yeah, that's, there you your, go. that's your fish right there. There you there, go. So, that's yeah. what we'll do. There we Deal. go. Deal. Deal. <laughs> Let's do it. See you, See you man. I think that's called crushing it. That's fun, man. It's funny, the sun is starting.